Welcome to all of you to our eighth session. Believe it or not, it is eighth session. Wow. <laughs> it's going fast for me. I don't know how fast it's going for you, but it's an eighth session that we have together on faith and um, violence. Um, we have two guests with us, and after my introductory remarks, they will be introduced and uh, we'll follow our regular procedure. Um, let me just say those um, that this association between faith and violence, um, especially during 9-11, but in other places as well, has brought uh, to attention the importance of faith for globalization processes in general, or importance of faith in public affairs. Uh, brought attention to it, not made it important. Conflicts, as we've read also early on in that session, are often now justified less on ideological grounds, but on religious grounds. And uh, globalization, as uh, our main teacher, the main kick, uh, to whom I'm sidekick, you have to come up with a better word for this. Uh, what is a person uh, to whom I'm a sidekick to me? <laughs> um, as Tony Blair often says, globalization pulls people together and religion separates them. And in an interdependent world, uh, destabilizing effects of conflicts based on uh, localized particular loyalties uh, have important impact broader than just that particular locale. Uh, but what is precisely the link between religion and contemporary violence? We have examined some of that early on, first session when we discussed about 9-11 uh, as a case study. Is religion a factor, the main factor? Uh, proxy for something else, and we've gone through a wide variety of options. Um, now we are returning to this topic uh, freshly, maybe with a set of slightly different uh, questions. I think our assumption can be said that it is that religion is an important uh, factor, but um, certainly we've, I think, generally uh, agreed that all monocausal explanation of such large cases of scale cases of violence uh, as um, often have been the case in the recent history uh, are suspect. But then the question is um, that we've discussed in this session, that we've read materials about are fates by their nature violent? If fates are associated with violence, what's the character of that relationship? And then if fates are not, so to say, by nature, pre them to be violent, what are the conditions under which they morph and possibly become uh, violent? How do fates uh, interact with other factors in the context of violence? And uh, what are the consequences for peacemaking? Uh, why does it matter? Somebody asked that question in, during one of our sections. So we figured this one out. Why does it, uh, why does it matter? I think that's a very important uh, question. Uh, to address some of these issues, um, we have looked at a set of readings as well as case studies, and two experts are here with us. But before they come and talk, um, let me just sketch what I thought that we uh, roughly uh, read. Um, our fates by nature violence. violence. Some of our readings, at least one of our readings, suggested, uh, well, no, not suggested, uh, strenuously um, argued, <laughs> right, that religions are violent. No, that religions kill, right? That's uh, Christopher Hitchens. And it's not quite sure exactly what the nature of that argument was, except kind of a string of uh, uh, powerful anecdotes, but I think it may be summarized. <laughs> but it may be summarized. I mean, let me put it. This <laughs> it's not. not <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I was trying not to put him down too. <laughs> to come not. Come not. Come not too hard on him. But I guess I'm not quite succeeding. But <laughs> I, I think that the argument is probably summarized in this quotation that he has from John Stuart Mill, right? That religion uh, is a kind of form of mental delusion, a form of untruthfulness, right? And at the same time that it is, that it does uh, constitute a great moral uh, evil. Now we read also Jurgens Meyer's book, Terror in the Mind of God, and there religion ends up being somewhat more ambivalent. It contains the seeds of violence. It contains also seeds of peace. Religious imagination, says Jurgens Meyer, always has had the propensity to absolutize and to project images of cosmic war. Always has had, right? 
Uh, at the same time, every re religious tradition has projected images of tranquility and peace and has resources of that sort. And then for him, the solution to this problem lies in uh, the recognition that religions give spirit to public life and, pro and provides a beacon for moral order. Uh, that's the very end of his book. But at the same time, he argues it needs kind of a temper of enlightened rationality to protect it from the worst dimensions of itself. Now, for today's session, we did not uh, reread uh, Martin, David Martin, but I thought that David Martin's idea of religions as having a certain kind of repertoire that can be played in various registers, certain things foregrounded, the other's background, and certain things transformed also as the history uh, progresses, uh, might be a very fruitful, fruitful one and can be put along the lines of these, uh, these two if we categorize possible responses. Um, and then uh, he, uh, if, if his idea, uh, if, if you go with his uh, notion, we wouldn't be searching for something like the essence of individual religion and asking whether it's violent or not, as in the case of Jurgensmeyer partly, right? We wouldn't do that for all religions in aggregate also. I think this is a Jurgensmeyer thesis as well. We'd instead asking a question, identifying a configuration of element in the repertoire, uh, which at the given time go one way or the other. And I think we read something to the, to, uh, of this sort uh, as we were reading our materials, I think, especially um, a kind of debate between a classical tradition or classical configuration of religious repertoire and certain forms of distortions. And one way to um, analyze these is to look at, differentiate between kind of external conditions that inf influence the way repertoire is played and then what happens internally to the repertoire, what happens to religion inside, right? And uh, in terms of external uh, conditions, uh, we've studied the case uh, and we'll discuss it much more. Uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism, paradox of a Buddhist monk who takes up uh, arms, external conditions, if Tambia is to be followed, is a perceived threat to religion, religion of Buddha, uh, threat to culture, language and culture of Sinhalese, and threat to a nation sovereign territory, which is motherland of Sri Lanka. <laughs> and then a certain sense of rights to participate in, uh, in the politics and uh, then protecting the rights of or, or, the, or, or the sons of soil uh, from various out, uh, outside influences. Um, in the case of Serbian uh, church, I think something similar can be, some similar kinds of steps can be, can be retraced. And as we were reading uh, also for today, the, uh, the, the, the um, um, Khalid uh, Abdul Fadl, right? I'm, uh, I'm missing, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm missing his, 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 his very fine piece, which I'm blanking on his uh, name. He differentiated quite, quite uh, compellingly, I think, between a kind of classical uh, mm, tradition with moral vision given to humanity and kind of civilizational uh, mission and contrasted in the context of colonialist and modernist uh, uh, movements, opposition to the West as the form which that, uh, that uh, religion uh, takes and a kind of uh, struggle for power and then war generating uh, ideology. Uh, so those were some of the external forces which play religious registers in different way. And then uh, possible we can think about internal conditions within each, uh, each religion. And uh, one way to think about it is, well, there are lots of folks who simply don't follow the teaching of a particular uh, religion, who don't care too much about the teaching. They identify with it, but they don't care about uh, religious teaching. Or um, uh, I have tried to distinguish uh, in the text that was your optional reading, knowing <coughs> that I had the right to make you listen to this idea, <laughs> whether, whether you want to read it or not, right? The text which was your optional uh, reading was, I've tried to distinguish between what I called thick and thin religiosity, and I'm partly building on the use of thick and thin by Geertz and especially by Michael uh, Walzer. Um, thick religiosity is uh, a certain moral vision of religion, embedded in an account of self, social relations, and the good. You've heard me speak about that, and that embedded in a larger interpretation of reality. Uh, and then that combined with a certain tradition of argumentation about this. All religious traditions are not static, and they're not internally 
uh, kind of simply making claims. Rather, there, there, there are debates going on across the lines and over a period o of time. And then a sense of certain connection that that gives to the, to the ultimate sense of a holy um, and the imperative of self-transcendence. Those will be some of the elements of this thick religiosity. But then what happens often is thinning out of religion to what could be described as cultural uh, resource, right? And what ends up being discarded is that you can see that in Tumbia's article and many other instances also, but ends up being discarded is this broad moral vision what ends up being discarded is the long and lengthy tradition on reas of reason debate about the, the, the goods that that rep religion represents. And what you end up having is something uh, retained sense of ultimacy and of the sacred. And that sacred then shrouds the mundane causes with, uh, with an aura of, uh, of sacred, legitimizes and motivates for action, but what guides the action doesn't stem from this moral vision, but rather stems from all sorts of causes which have attached themselves to religion or for which religion provides uh, legitimation. So both external influences and kind of internal transformation of religions takes place if religions are to be employed um, in a, in to, to sanction and to motivate to, uh, to violence. Uh, roughly, that's uh, some of the reading, at least what we have done, and, it, uh, and, uh, and, and the way maybe of thinking, or at least suggesting a uh, framework to think about relationship between religion and uh, violence. But now is my time to give room to H. L., as I have been instructed uh, to call. <laughs> Lisa? So I will Nibiratna, and uh, he's asked us to call him H.L. Uh, his early research interests were fashioned by three factors in the context of growing up in Sri Lanka. First, the Buddhist rituals that were all around him stimulated him to explore the meaning that these rituals held in Sri Lanka. Second, Sri Lanka was going through radical social change during his lifetime. Third, Sri Lanka was groping for identity and economic security in the post colonial era. His work represents a critical examination of the themes and social processes arising from the kind of social context that we've just mentioned, which he says is commonplace in the contemporary world. Social change emerging from colonialism and a search for national identity and economic security have brought out a great deal of idealism, but much more turbulence, confusion, and human suffering, he says. His specialties are religion and politics, socialism, classical social theory, human rights, democracy and free market economy, ethno-nationalism, cinema, art and popular culture. And of his many, many publications, his most recent are 2001, Buddhist Monks and Ethnic Politics in Anthropology Today, and The Work of Kings, The New Buddhism in Sri Lanka, published by University of Chicago. He serves as Professor Emeritus in the Anthropology Department of the University of Virginia. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lisa. Very nice to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, let me, I know that I have only 15 minutes, and, and uh, so your professor has already told me that you, you're familiar with uh, Sri Lanka, so I'm not going to take any time uh, talking about, but just to remind you, refresh, refresh your minds, I will just mention that Sri Lanka is an island in the Indian Ocean, and it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's 25,000 square miles, which is the size of West Virginia. And uh, the majority ethnic group, and the, uh, and the population is about 20 million. The majority ethnic group is Sinhalese or Sinhala, uh, uh, about 70%. And they are Buddhist mostly. <coughs> Excuse me. And the largest minority are the Tamils. Uh, they're about 15%, and they're mostly Hindus. Uh, th I say mostly because there are both among the Tamils and the Sinhalese, there are Christians. And the Christian population is about 7%. And about another 7% are Muslims. And a peculiar feature of the categorization of uh, people and religions in Sri Lanka is to, uh, which is, an in, I think, Sri Lanka inherited from the British, is that uh, Muslims are considered somehow an ethnic group rather than a religious group. 
and of course it, it is understood that they are also ethnic but uh, I mean really religious but they are classified under ethnic groups. Uh, since the 16th century Sri Lanka or Ceylon as it was known to the Westerners until 1972 has been under some form of colonial European domination first the Portuguese then the Dutch um, uh, held the, the maritime regions of the island until the arrival of the British at the dawn of the 19th century. Unlike the Portuguese and the Dutch, the British were able to bring the entire island under their control and held it until 1948. And uh, Christianity arrived with the Portuguese and the large majority of the Christians in Sri Lanka are Catholics and the reformed churches were introduced by the Dutch and the British. In 1915, there were riots that uh, targeted Muslims which were forcefully put down by the British government. It is instructive to remember that it is not religion per se that provoked the violence against the Muslims, but uh, economic dominance in trade, which, which the rising single business classes wanted to curb. Economic self-interest in the form of competition for in education, jobs, and business is at the root of most of the recent violence as well as, as, I, see, as I see the subject. It's important for us to remember this when we talk about Buddhist violence. Most media reports on violence in Sri Lanka end with the statement that the Sinhalese are Buddhists and Tamils are Hindus, which suggests religious conflict. This is not the case at all. There is no crusade or jihad in Sri Lanka. Religious violence in Sri Lanka is rather an <coughs> attempt by certain sections of the population to use certain traditional ideas about society, polity, and well-being to further their individual and class interests. If the Sri Lankan conflict is primarily economic, why is it so often considered religious? Why is it Buddhist violence? What is it that is Buddhist about it? What connection does it have with Buddhism? For an answer, we might look at what we might call the paradigm of ideal society in the dominant pre-colonial Sri Lankan worldview. This paradigm was first articulated in the national chronicle known as the Mahavansa 1500 years ago. Uh, the island of Sri Lanka, according to this paradigm, is the island of righteousness because it has been foreseen by the Buddha that it is in Sri Lanka that his dharma or message would shine. It follows that good government has as its first responsibility the nourishment and protection of Buddhism. It is the particular destiny of the Sinhala ethnic group symbolized by their Buddhist king to carry out this responsibility. The exclusivity and uh, responsibility, uh, the exclu exclusivity of this responsibility and the implied exclusive ownership of the island by the majority Sinhala ethnic group is expressed in a myth in which the Buddha miraculously draws near the shores of Sri Lanka, a faraway landmass, frightens the aboriginal, that is non-Sinhala inhabitants to fleeing into this uh, landmass and then returns it to its original geographical location. Now, uh, you know, it's a clearly a clever myth because it is uh, ethnic cleansing but non-violent. And because you couldn't possibly uh, involve the Buddha in violence, so you, you must have some other way of ethnic cleansing. Um, when, the, when Buddhism's well-being and longevity are assured, nothing, everything else that is important like health, happiness, prosperity follow automatically. This means that the Buddhism should be protected at any cost. What we have here is an irrevocable linking of Sinhala ethnicity, Buddhism, kingship, and a territory as, uh, as that, that is one and indivisible. To learn more about the relevance of this paradigm for violence in Sri Lanka, we must look at the work of the early 20th century reformer Anagarika Dharmapala. Dharmapala place the blame for the country's poverty and overall social and uh, moral decline squarely on the colonial rule and Christian missionary activity. In his view, pre-colonial Sri Lanka was a happy, bountiful and glorious utopia of the Sinhala Buddhists. This demi-paradisical state was made possible by the moral purity of the Sinhala Buddhist people arising from their unfailing adherence to the five Buddhist precepts and otherwise following a Buddhist way of life. Colonial rule and uh, Christian missionaries disrupted this idyllic society by introducing foreign food, drink and clothing and customs and mores that led people to violate the Buddhist precepts. 
The monk's role, Dharmapal argued, was to help the people overcome their poverty and degradation by guiding them in morality as well as discipline economic activity and restoring to them their glorious erstwhile identity by reviving Buddhism and national culture. And he exhorted the monks to traverse the countryside and perform this national service. It is quite obvious that this model can only work with a homogeneous society where all citizens belong to a single ethno-religious group or where any outsiders must willingly or unwillingly accept majority hegemony and subordinate or erase altogether their own identity. But social changes brought about by colonial contact with the modern West have shattered the relevance of this paradigm and changed it from being a more or less harmless periodic legitimation of the status quo into a source of majority hegemony and oppression of the minorities. In the pre-colonial state, despite the homogenizing rhetoric of the paradigm, the ground reality contained mechanisms of incorporating the minorities and their cultures. The paradigm, in other words, was a fiction that provided for a rhetoric of exclusivist identification of Buddhism and single ethnicity to coexist with, the parad with pragmatic arrangements to deal with wh what we today call diversity. In contrast, in the new society brought about by colonial rule, the paradigm's conception of protecting Buddhism and the nation took new meaning as a propagandist slogan for power-seeking elites and influence-peddling interest groups. In particular, with the incremental introduction of the right to vote starting about 1910, culminating in, in universal suffrage in 1931, Slogans for protecting Buddhism and nation become, became excellent platforms for politicians intent on seeking political office, electoral office, I mean. The grandiloquent themes of the paradigm, now spelt out as religion, nation, identity, ethnicity, language, national culture, and the splendor of the past, could be used by politicians to appeal to, uh, appeal, uh, to, appeal to primordial sentiments and get elected to power. These themes were put to the test in a conscious and organized manner for the first time in the general election of 1956, and they emerged with flying colors as winners. Buddhist monks were at the forefront of this election, and they became, along with their lay counterparts, a powerful lobby for religious nationalist agenda, for a, for a religious nation, nationalist agenda that, in effect, placed disabilities on the minorities in their pursuit of opportunities in education, state employment and the professions and business enterprise. The most disabling of these are number one, the elevation of the majority language as the one official language. And number two, the restriction of school admission to the minority children by resort to a process called standardization. The Tamil minority was also greatly alienated by the government programs of peasant resettlement in regions they considered to be, a, to be their traditional homelands. Starting with non-violent protests and civil disobedience, the Tamils responded with increasing militancy, especially after their struggle changed hands from a generation of educated elite politicians to armed and relative, relatively uneducated uh, youth rebels. Among groups of such rebels, the LTTE or the Tigers became preeminent, and their attacks and the con attempt of the Sri Lankan security forces to contain them have led to a disastrous civil war in which an estimated 70,000 have been killed and a million displaced. Before concluding this, I would like to make two general points. First, when we talk about Buddhist violence, we generally mean violence committed against the minority Tamils by the Buddhist majority. But since the 1970s, we have seen the rise of a violent movement of Buddhist youth known as the JVP, especially in their second insurrection about the 18, 1989, they committed unspeakable atrocities on fellow Buddhists, including targeted Buddhist monks. The single Buddhist-dominated state responded in kind. These developments, along with the, with the terrorist attacks of the LTTE, combined with a general decline in the underlying moral anchors of the social order, have contributed to a broader culture of violence and a devaluation of human life. A proper understanding of Buddhist violence must consider this broad overall decline in the, in, <coughs> the, in the value foundations of the society. The second point I want to make uh, is of some more direct relevance to your concerns about globalization. 
with the globalization uh, pulls diverse people together or pushes them apart in um, which words uh, it, it it seems common sense at the le at least to our western economic rationality that the free exchange that is at the center of globalization does bring people together i think this is a fundamental insight of the sociologist emil durkheim when he talked about organic solidarity in his well known work the division of labor in society but the Sri Lankan case seems to suggest that this could work both ways. Data from other societies illustrate the, um, this ambivalence towards globalization as well. Rel religion nationalism in Sri Lanka is deeply distrustful of foreigners and foreign cultural and consumer items. This is the antithesis of globalization. It includes the denunciation of foreign NGOs, which are assumed to be pro-Tamil and therefore part of a conspiracy to divide the country. Large scale globalization in Sri Lanka began with the free market uh, policies of the 1977 government, which is associated with the Indian military intervention of 1987, which is a black mark for globalization. The religious nationalists are also opposed to number one, imported popular entertainment like Hollywood and Bollywood films. And um, um, they are opposed to um, fast foods like uh, McDonald's and uh, Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken and so on. <laughs> to, and they are opposed to um, s people celebrating Valentine's Day. Some of this opposition could take violent form as when the, they exploded a bomb at a heavily subscribed open air concert in which two Bollywood heartthrobs of millions, uh, Shah Rukh Khan and uh, Preeti Zinta mm -hmm. were to perform, uh, killing two young people and injuring many. Uh, and I can also um, you the example the vandalism caused in 2004 uh, of Buddhist murals done by a young Dutch um, woman uh, um, in a Sri Lankan temple and uh, I have an entire paper on this subject uh, 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 and I'd be happy to talk more about later. On the plus side, Sri Lanka has a business community which welcomes globalization and it has periodically expressed itself responsibly on matters of grave public concern like the state of uh, law and order, good governance and the need for a national consensus. Now, do I have any more time or this? Uh, I think you do, that's right. How many minutes? Oh, okay. Two minutes. Yes, I can do it in two minutes. <laughs> I, I, I just want to <coughs> mention uh, one thing about conversions. There is uh, one, of the, one of the grievances of the Buddhist uh, clergy and the right-wing Buddhist you know, establishment uh, in general is this thing called conversion. They are called unethical conversions. And these are conversions actually of the uh, evangelicals. So there's no real opposition to the established church, uh, the Catholic church going back 500 years. And uh, of course, people in Sri Lanka don't quite distinguish between these and they think uh, Catholic, uh, Catholicism and the reformed churches and the evangelists are all sort of equated. Of course, there are some sections of people are knowledgeable. But what, what I want to say is that, in fact, I won't quote uh, a very well-known Buddhist monk scholar, Valpolo Rahula, some of uh, you are familiar with his name. Rahula told me in one of his uh, interviews uh, that uh, the people were not opposed to Christianity. The people would have welcomed Christianity had it been, uh, had it come by itself rather than as, as as a uh, companion to colonialism, to imperialism. And, and Dharmapal, this great Sinhala Buddhist uh, propagandist, uh, has written in one of his um, uh, books, uh, writings, he, he has no problem with uh, Christianity. His problem was with the missionaries because they were humiliating him. They were, they were not only him, but his culture. Uh, they, the early missionaries, they, you know, this insensitivity of the missionaries is something that is, uh, I mean, if they're smart, they could be a little bit more, you know, <laughs> sensitive. Uh, and uh, anyway, the Dharma, I want to just quote this, um, this wonderful uh, statement of uh, Dharmapada. He says, uh, he talks very uh, adoringly, actually, of the gentle Nazarene, meaning Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. but, but his problem was with, with not with the gentle Nazarene, but but, uh, but the mission is, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you. I'm sure we will return to many aspects of, uh, of this paper. One thing that I want to highlight, which, uh, which um, we haven't talked much about, and that's the question of evangelism. 
it is one of the very important issues in Muslim-Christian relations. It is Hindu-Christian relations and a number of other ways in which that relationship, uh, those relationships are tense on account of a uh, certain understanding of evangelism, of dawah, of spreading one's faith. And that, too, is part and parcel of our globalized setting. That needs to be kind of named as an, as an issue. Now, um, uh, it is my honor to introduce to you uh, Peter Kuzmich. Uh, I thought, uh, as is the custom, uh, mm, our guest will be introduced uh, by somebody else than myself, and so I came completely unprepared. <laughs> and Neil the Magnificent told me uh, that's my punishment for not being present <laughs> at, a, at a meeting of TAs. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's, a pleasant, it's a pleasant duty. Um, uh, Peter, I've known Peter for about um, 35 years now, um, and uh, uh, it, it's tough to do for me to describe Peter, maybe because I know him so well. Um, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe that's really irrelevant whether I do or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I do, <laughs> and therefore all the implications <coughs> of uh, mm. knowing you well apply in this particular case just because I think that I do. <laughs> um, well, P P Peter, is, uh, Peter is an educator, um, a founder of um, educational institutions uh, of higher learning in uh, former Yugoslavia. He is also a public intellectual. Um, uh, inserting himself in uh, major ways in uh, the politics uh, and broader culture, I think not so much politics of, uh, of Croatia and more broadly. He's a humanitarian who has worked um, long and hard hours, seen uh, unspeakable things uh, throughout the war in former Yugoslavia and its aftermath. He's also uh, respected and well-known worldwide evangelical uh, leader who has capacity to bridge to other traditions in uh, extraordinary ways so that he can be main, main speaker in the World, uh, 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 World Council of Churches event uh, as well as in evangelical events. And that's one of the things that has kind of uh, characterized Peter's uh, career, namely ability to, uh, to span things, hold things together which otherwise tend to fall, uh, fall apart. Now, I have a, a kind of more personal relationship to him. Peter uh, is my, well, pr pr Peter set me on to the course, for ill or for good, set me on to the course of doing theology or being intellectually uh, interested at all because at that time he was dating my sister to whom he is married uh, <laughs> right now. Fruitfully <laughs> dating, yeah. Uh, so it's with much pleasure that I introduce to you <laughs> Peter Kuzmi. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that my sister will crucify me if I don't know. <laughs> well, can I? <laughs> Thank you, Miroslav. Uh, you're very kind. <clears throat> I think I'll stand, not for your sake, but for my sake, because I'm still dealing with jet lag. I have just come from the Balkans uh, two nights ago. And it's wonderful to be with you here at Yale. I understand this is an interdisciplinary uh, seminar. Um, now, let me uh, start with my own background, which will illustrate what we are talking about. How many of you have traveled Central and Southeastern Europe? Quite a few, it's a world class. Okay, <laughs> all right. So if you visualize the map, you're coming from Germany by car through Austria and you want to go to Greece, okay? You enter former Yugoslavia in a place where I was born called Slovenia. You exit it from the Slavic Macedonia to go into Greece. And in between you have Croatia, you have Serbia, you have Bosnia, you have Montenegro, you have uh, the autonomous, what used to be autonomous regions of Kosovo in the south and uh, of Vojvodina in northern Serbia. Now, Yugoslavia has been called the India of Europe more than once because of this ethnic and religious makeup. Now, here I am, I was born in Slovenia 
on the border with Austria and Hungary. Maybe I should do a little map because about one third of you didn't drive. <laughs> Now, one should not really film this map. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, well, there's Italy. Don't ask me about the shoe there. <laughs> Remember our high school geography? Austria. And then comes Hungary. And we go down like this, Romania. And we've got Bulgaria. And we've got Albania. And we've got Greece. OK. And so you have Slovenia up here. And you have Croatia, which looks like this. And you have Bosnia here in the center. Croatia, Slovenia, and we have Serbia here. Montenegro. Have you heard of Montenegro? Kosovo, you must have heard, because we've got a distinguished <laughs> lady here from Kosovo, or Kosova. And Macedonia. OK. I was born in Slovenia. I have lived in Serbia in Belgrade for two years. I've lived in Sarajevo and Banja Luka in Bosnia. I'm a citizen of Croatia. So when people who are well informed like you are hear this, <coughs> and they say, wait a moment, that's the part of the world where they have reinvented ethnic cleansing at the end of the 20th century, uh, where people have been frantically searching for their ethnic identity. Identity, as you're finding out in this course, is a big word. We live in a world of warring identities. And others have been fanatically fighting for their ethnic purity. So who are you, actually? Aren't you a little confused? If anybody would think that I might be confused, I take a little soft revenge. I bring my wife, Vlasta, into the picture because I met Vlasta in a college in Germany where she came from Serbia, although she's Croatian, although her father is half German and her mother is fully Czech. <laughs> and so the answer in the words of, uh, paraphrase of the words of Robert Frost, would be, don't worry about me, I'm not confused, I am just well mixed, <laughs> like some of you. Now, telegraphically, just a few points. November 1989. One million people are gathered in a place called Gazi Mestan, celebrating the 600th anniversary of the Kosovo battle. One million people. National TV in all of these republics is carrying the event. Mr. Slobodan Milosevic, of course, is the principal speaker. And among other things, because Yugoslavia, by the way, a compound, the Yug South Slavic peoples, like all of these, plus two million Albanians, uh, Yugoslavia is in a crisis. And Mr. Milosevic says, among other things, this Yugoslav crisis we will resolve by constitutional means or extra-constitutional means. And then he says, this crisis we will resolve by peaceful means or other means. Uh, you don't need to be very intelligent to interpret what the other means are as an option to peaceful means. At that time, I was writing for a secular progressive uh, weekly, and I wrote an article. And I said, we have heard the rhetoric of war. Wars begin with words. The hand of the potential killer, I did not name him, is in the air. Somebody better stop him before the innocent people suffer. Now, this college is in Osijek, here. And we had students from all over the place and some neighboring countries. And two of my Serbian students organized a protest against me, the professor and the principal of the school. And they said, well, you have uh, pronounced our president a killer. And I said, I, I didn't. I said, potentially. 
<laughs> wars begin with words, OK? I wish there was some kind of an international regulatory body which would prevent hate speech before it becomes hate crime, which would prevent the abuse of religion and instrumentalization of religion for violent means before violence is committed. Let's, uh, this is November 89, okay? Five months later, elections are held in the different republics, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, and Macedonia. And you have all of the republics, except for Serbia and Montenegro, elect the democratic pro-Western governments. Some of them nationalistic because the rhetoric from Belgrade coming from Milosevic and his comrades became increasingly bellicose, triumphalistic. But Mr. Milosevic and the president of Montenegro skillfully controlled and manipulated the media and they were able to stay in the office. So you have two capitals of two republics that want to keep on to the old Socialist Federation of Yugoslavia and their privileges. And the army is on their side. Once they find out that that is impossible, they change the rhetoric and they move from the Socialist Federation of Yugoslavia to creating Greater Serbia. Okay? Now, and that leads us to the beginning of the wars. You've read about it, ethnic cleansing, the abuse of religion. Bosniak Muslims who were victims uh, in more ways than one can describe, mass rapes, ethnic cleansing, barbarities, Srebrenica slaughter of 7,000 men, and so on. Bosniak Muslims were first attacked by the Serbian minority, supported from Serbia, and they, the aggression was almost like a medieval aggression, medieval crusades, with a sword in one hand, and the cross in another. When Croats, who are 17% of the population of Bosnia, saw, and Croats are Catholics, that the international community will do nothing, they said, well, we better grab some land. And so you had Croat Catholics and Serbian Orthodox fight nominal Muslims in Bosnia. This is the heart of the problem. This is the prelude to Kosovo, which is our youngest nation. We created seven eight new nation states. We hold a world record, I think. <laughs> uh, and Kosovo is the last one. Montenegro is only two years, two years old. All of that started with that speech in Kosovo in November 89, and then with the abuse of religion. And finally, you have these, these uh, sick political leaders with sick ambitions, former communists. They have discovered the power of religious symbols. And they are instrumentalizing religious symbols. They are using religious rhetoric. And so you hear language like heavenly Serbia. And some old myths are resurrected. You hear similar sacralization of the political and ethnic entities like when you hear the language of the holy Russia. Just watch if Russia is holy. It's like holy inquisition. Or, or, or holy crusades, and so on, because if it is holy, you cannot touch it. There is already a triumphalism and militancy in the very religious description of who you are and what you are doing, although there is no thick religiosity there, and we can, uh, we can discuss that later. I have been warned that my time is about up. I've yes. tried to walk, I've tried to... <laughs> Okay, you see, w one needs to see that in, in, in the context. Communist ideology, singular, all across Eastern Europe, has been replaced by nationalistic ideologies, plural. Nationalistic ideologies have been and are supported by the resurgence of the old national religions. Whatever was, was suppressed under communism, of course, once the lid was off, started exploding. One was nationalism. You know, the communists set up to build the Internationale. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. 
So ethnicity was not that important. Russian more or less were dominant in the Soviet Union. Serbs were quite dominant in former Yugoslavia. And so you had the explosion of nationalism and explosion of religion. And they found each other again in a very uncritical fashion. And so religion and ethnicity uh, are now used by political leaders to fight the others, those who are different. We can mention Kosovo later because that is also nominally, nominally Muslim, uh, as was Bosniak uh, Islam, nominally Muslim, but now there is a radicalization of the Islamic option taking place because there is a radicalization of, of Serbian Orthodoxy or Croat Catholicism in the neighboring countries. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>